Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Holy smokes. Long day. Hopefully the, the message will be really good. If you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 12, that's where we're going to be. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 31. As uh, Sean mentioned, we're in this series called No Place Like Home, and we're talking about uh, both our spiritual house and our natural homes, that the, the main responsibility for us as believers is to make sure that we're caring for these areas, our, our families and our, our natural families and our spiritual families. And so in part three, we're going to be looking at this, uh, this idea of how can we continue to care for the, the places that we, we live. So Mark chapter 12 uh, is the, the passage of scripture that we We'll look at, and Jesus is having a conversation, and a religious person asks him a question. And we're going to look at this question and pull out some principles so that we can apply to our lives, so that we can care and nurture for the place that God has called us to steward. So verse uh, 28 says this, one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to this debate. So Jesus is having a conversation with people, and one person is listening, and he realizes that Jesus had answered everything well. And so he asked a question, of all the commandments, which is the most important? How many of us know that's a pretty interesting question? Out of everything, uh, there's about 10 commandments. There's also other commandments, about, I think, over close to 300 commandments that the religious, not religious, but the, the Jewish people would abide by. And so they're like, there's a lot. Which one is the most important? So Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel. The Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. But he doesn't stop there. He says this, the second is equally as important. So the guy asked for one answer. Jesus gives him two. Second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. And so we're going to look at this passage of scripture, pull out some principles that we can apply to our lives so that we can live the life of faith that God has called us to live. So join with me as we pray. God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Your word is truth, God. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would take a, a simple message like this and breathe on it, God. We don't want just information, but Lord, we want to receive an impartation of faith that would change us from the inside out, God. We don't want to just be hearers of your word, but Lord, we want to be doers. So Lord, we position ourselves to hear from you so that we can live out everything that you want to communicate to us. So give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that's soft, open, and receptive to do and live everything that you're calling us to so that we can make a difference right where we are. We thank you for who you are. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, the title of my message tonight is this, love where you're at. Love where you're at. Uh, me and my wife, we just moved into a new home. Uh, we went from the, the cool, breezy hills of Mililani to the heat of Ever Beach. It's a pretty big transition, you know. 96706, Ever Beach banger now. That's kind of now my zip code. <laughs> and so it's, it's been a transition into a new community. And one of the things that I appreciate about the area that we live in is it's kind of been established. So we're not moving into a brand new place, but we're moving into a newer community. So everyone kind of knows everyone in our area. And the, the street that we live on, the cul-de-sac, is pretty friendly. Like, for the most part, everyone is nice. I remember the first day that we were moving in, uh, our Filipino neighbor. <laughs> like, no one sweeps their driveway, right? So we're moving in. The garage is open. We have the, the movers. And I just see this Filipino guy just, like, randomly sweeping his his driveway, but he's not really sweeping. He's just looking to see what's, what's happening next door, you know, knee LA action, right? <laughs> so, oh, neighbors. So I, I met him. I just thought it was pretty funny. So our, our area is pretty cool. Like, I, I really feel like God opened the door for us to, to live here, and it's, it's a great place. Uh, but I have a friend that we work out with, and he lives, uh, he moved into the same area, just a different part of our community, and he hasn't had as easy of a transition as me and my wife have. We have great neighbors uh, they're awesome, but his neighbors has kind of been giving him issues. In fact, the whole community that we live in has a Facebook page, and if you ever want to see drama, just go on the Facebook page, because you see all the action of what's happening in the community. And uh, this, my friend, has had several bad interactions with the neighbors. One of the neighbors basically was blasting music so loud that was vibrating their house. 
And I was like, he posted about that. Why does your music have to be so loud and so forth like that? And so I, I read that. I was talking to him at the gym about it. And he was explaining, yeah, man, they're so rude and inconsiderate. They park everywhere. They take up all the parking. They basically play music to the wee hours of the night. And I was just like listening to him and thinking to myself, wow, that kind of sucks. I like my area. Your area is different. And then recently he, uh, uh, he posted a video of uh, late at night, uh, a girl basically got drunk and vomited on his front porch <laughs> and have it on the ring camera, posted it on, on, the, on the Facebook page. And uh, everybody's just commenting about it. And I am reading this post and I'm thinking to myself, man, sucks to be you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that was my honest response. I was just like, man, I, I'm glad I don't live where you are. I'm glad I live where I'm at, drama free. And the more I started to think about that, I realized that, man, I kind of not really living out what this verse is telling us to do, right? Like, being saved since uh, 2003, been in the church, working for the church, and one of the things I realized about myself is the longer you've been in church, the more sanitized you want your life to be. Isn't that true? Like, you kind of want to stay away from drama, you kind of want to stay away from people who are not following God, right? You don't want to associate with, you know, people that God is calling us to love. And when I was reading this post, I started to think, man, God, has my heart gotten so hard that the people that you're wanting me to reach is the people that I find myself avoiding? Like, I don't know about you, I tend to love people who like the same things that I like, who have the same values that I like, uh, who uh, talk the same way, have the same language, and so forth. Like, we tend to gravitate to people who share common interests and so forth, and I think that's great. I think we need to have that in our lives, but if we as believers only have Christians within our lives, then we're not living out the life that God has called us to live. Like, if all of our relationships are just believers, as good as that is, we're not being the church that God has called us to be. Like, we should have some dirty people in our life. And dirty meaning just, like, we all have our junks and so forth. Not that you ever come to church and you're super clean. We still have our issues. But there should be people who don't know Jesus actively in our lives. Like, we should have relationships with these people. And so I just found myself reading a Facebook page thinking, man, am I becoming a bubble Christian where I don't want anyone to interrupt the smoothness of my life, you know? And so reading this passage of scripture, because God is calling us to love everybody. And everybody is not just people that we like. It's the people that we don't necessarily like. It's those neighbors that blast their music at 12 o'clock at night, you know? It's the neighbors that we're still, like, they're still popping fireworks now. I'm like, what's the celebration? Like, my dog goes crazy because they're still lighting up fireworks, you know? Like, these are the people that God has called us to build bridges of relationships with. But too often, I find myself, and maybe you can find yourself in this boat too, is that we start to avoid these people when God is calling us to connect with them. And so what Jesus is inviting us to do is to love our neighbors as ourselves. Why? Because our love for God is seen in how well we love people. We can't say we have a genuine relationship with God and our relationship with God is thriving if we lack love for people. And what Jesus is specifically saying here is this, that he's calling us to love people that we don't necessarily like, calling us to love our neighbors. And so the point of tonight's message is very simple. That we've got to love God and got to love people. Simple message. But I don't want you to tune out just because it's so simple. Because sometimes it's the simple messages that we need to hear constantly because it's easy to hear but harder to live. And so this idea of us loving God and loving people is a simple concept, but God wants us to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. So my goal for uh, for us tonight is this, is that we would move from just listening to living lives of action. So two questions that we're going to ask from this passage of scripture so that we can pull out principles from our lives is this. So if God is calling us to love our neighbor, we've got to ask this, qu- this question. Who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? And I want to give you a running definition of what our neighbor is based on God's word is this. Our neighbor is anyone in our proximity with whom we can share God's love with. 
anyone within our proximity with whom we can share God's love with. So who does that mean? It's the people that we actually live next to, our actual physical neighbors. Uh, how many of you know your neighbors by name? Some of us. Like this message is good for some of us, and for the rest of us, sometimes it's like, man, we don't really know this. And so we got to love our people within proximity of us. So the people that we live next to, the people that we work with, the people basically that we see frequently. There's people in our lives, for most of us, we all have people that we'll see consistently on an everyday basis. And so God is calling us to connect with these people in such a way that we can share God's love with them. And so it could be your, your barista at Starbucks. It could be uh, your bank teller if you still go to the bank. It could be basically anyone that you see, someone at the gym, anyone that you see on a consistent basis, that's the person that God has called us to share his love with. Uh, recently, we've been playing basketball. We have the YOCC, and so they've been putting some basketball rims in. I'm trying to relive my youth by playing basketball. And uh, when you get old like me, you don't play man-to-man -man defense basketball because that's a lot of running. <laughs> like you're trying to chase a person the whole time. And so what we play is old man basketball. It's basically you play zone defense. And so zone defense is this. You get assigned an area, and if a person comes into your area, that person is your responsibility. So I don't need to worry about the person on the other side of the court. It's not my responsibility. I have this area right here that I needed a guard, and if anyone comes into that area my responsibility. So in the same sense, I think for us, when we're talking about loving our neighbor, we all have people within our own proximity in our lives that God wants us to love. So if they're not in your area, they're not your responsibility. But as soon as they come into your area and you see them on a consistent basis, they become your responsibility because we have the love of God in our lives and it's these individuals within our sphere of influence that God wants us to share that love with. And so all of us have a sphere, your place that you work, your actual natural family, uh, the, the place that you live, all of these places that we find ourselves frequently being in, these are the people that God has called us to reach. So the second question is this. So if I know who my neighbor is, then how do I actually love them? How do I love my neighbor? neighbor in a way that God has called me to. So we're going to look at other aspects of scripture to give us an idea on how practically we can do this. So I want to make it super simple that anyone can live this out. So we're going to look at four ways from scripture in which God is calling us to love our neighbor. The first thing is this, we need to pray consistently. So for us to practically love our neighbor, we need to pray consistently for them. Colossians 4.3 says this, pray for us too, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, that God will give us many opportunities to what? To speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. So what Paul was doing, he was sharing his faith. He was basically starting churches all over. And what he was asking for is this, hey, can you pray for me that there be open doors for us to preach the good news? And so for you and I, in our sphere of influence, God is calling us, the first thing that we should be doing is praying for the people that God has placed within our lives. Like prayer is a hidden power that we have as believers. Like people won't necessarily know that you're praying for them, but you're actually inviting God and his spirit and his power to work on our behalf in that person's life. And so what prayer does is it paves the way for Jesus to be known into their lives. So the easiest and the first thing that we can do before we even have a conversation with the person is to begin to pray for them. Begin to pray for them. The reason why many of us are here tonight are here and have faith is because people prayed for us. And so we need to return the favor. Uh, I've been working out at this gym, CrossFit gym, for a long time, and God reminded me as I was prepping this message of a habit and a discipline that I used to do every time I went to the gym. So as soon as I got to the gym in the morning, the first thing that I did before I got out of my car is I would take a few minutes to pray for the actual gym. I started to pray, God, bring your presence here. Uh, I started to pray specifically for the people that I would see within the gym, and this is what habit that I got involved doing. And when I was praying a lot, I had way more opportunities with people. I had 
way more conversations with people about spiritual things. And during this time when I was doing it consistently, we were able to actually start a small group within the CrossFit gym. And over time, I, how many of us, you just lost the discipline. You stopped doing the things that brought you good fruit in your life. And so I just started to get busy. I saw working out as more of a get it in and get it over with. And so over time, I stopped doing that. And so the gym has just become a place for me to just do my own thing. And God was reminding me that, hey, I placed you here for a purpose. And that he reminded me that I need to begin to pray for people, pray for the people there. And one of the things that we can do within our jobs and so forth, and even within our families, is begin to pray for them. God, open their hearts. God, help them to see you, to know you, soften their hearts and so forth. And so one of the things that I've been doing now that I'm in this new community, I got to walk my dog every day. I have a little dog. He's not so little. He's like 90 pounds. I'm embarrassed walking him because he doesn't really listen to me. And so I'm like constantly trying to like act cool, but he's yanking me all over the place. Pray for me because he needs Jesus, okay? <laughs> so as I'm walking my dog, uh, I've been doing this recently. Within the last two weeks, I've been praying for my community. So as I'm walking my dog, the thing that I'm doing is like, hey, God, you placed me here for a purpose. I pray that you would open the hearts of the people here. I started to pray for different communities and different uh, homes and so forth. And I realized that sometimes we're not seeing the fruit that we want because we haven't done the simple thing of praying and inviting God into that place. And so if we want to see God move within our families, within our communities, he's inviting us and reminding us that the first thing that we need to do before we even have conversations with them is to pray. So my question to you is, are you praying for people? Is more of our prayers about us and God answering our prayers? Or is our prayers about God softening people's hearts so that I can share you with them? We got to pray for that first. Second thing we need to do after we pray for people is connect personally. We need to connect personally. We need to build relationships with people. There's a verse in Proverbs that will give you an insight on how we can practically Make relationships with people. It says this, Proverbs 18, 16. Giving a gift can open doors. It gives access to important people. Basically, how many of us love receiving gifts? How many of us, if the person that you don't necessarily like right now bought you something, that would change how you saw them? Right? All of us. Like, something happens within our hearts. Even if we, we were interacting with people and they irritate us, if they came to us and got, brought you a box of monopoles, how many of us know that that would change how you see them? Why? Because a gift opens the way into a person's heart. And so what God is saying through this proverb is this. One of the best things that we can do as believers is start blessing people. Why? Because a blessing would open the door for you to have conversations with people. Uh, my wife and I moved in to our place, right? And so we had her group came over to our house to have a small group. And so I was, they're having it in the living room. So I had to go to the bedroom because I don't want to hear what, you know, all that kind of stuff, giving them their privacy. So I have my headphones on, I'm on my laptop working on some stuff and I get a text from my wife. And she texts me, someone's at the door. And I'm like, well, okay, answer the door. That's exactly what I said. No, come, someone's at the door. So I come outside, and she, everyone is quiet. Like the whole small group is quiet, and they're saying, someone's at the door. So we go and open the door, and guess who it is? It's one of our neighbors, and they're giving, she gave us ceviche. She was saying, hey, we just wanted to welcome you into the, to the, into the community. And so we were giving you ceviche. And I was just like, why were we so scared to open the door? Like, the whole, she was like, I heard everybody talking. As soon as I pressed the button, it got quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and that convicted me. And that convicted me. You know why that convicted me? Because that's something that we as believers should have done first. Like, we should have been the ones going to every door saying, hey, we're just new to the community. Here's some, some cookies or something like that. Isn't it funny how people who don't know God sometimes act better than we do as believers? Like, we should be the most generous people. We should be the nicest people. We should be the most hospitable people. But sometimes you and I can be guilty of just thinking about ourselves that we forget that God has placed us around people for a purpose. 
And especially if you've been walking this walk of faith for a long time, we need to be reminded that we got to do the simple things. We should be the most generous. We should be doing these things constantly in our lives. Why? Because gifts open the doors into people's hearts. We do this all the time on mission trips. We will take a team. We will go to a different place. And you know what we'll bring all the time? Macadamia nuts, chocolates. And there's this one particular campus that they wouldn't let us on to connect with students. And so what we did is, hey, can we give chocolates to the principal? As soon as we did that, come on into the campus. Do whatever you want. Why? Because gifts open the way into the hearts of people. So if we want to start to see fruit in the lives of people, we should be generous with them. So here's some things that I can encourage you to do. Maybe one day just buy donuts for the office. Or maybe one day just buy coffee for a coworker. Something simple that we can do that opens the door for people. So the person that brought us ceviche, my dad brought us lao lao and brought us way too much lao lao. So you know what I did? I took them some lao lao. I said, you guys ever ate lao lao before? And one of the guys, uh, uh, Vietnamese, right, hon? He's like, no, I never ate that. <laughs> so I said, okay, just eat this with rice, okay? <laughs> Put it in the microwave. And I asked him a couple of days later if he liked it. He's like, yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> interesting (laughs) so be a blessing to people if people bless you be a blessing back to them Um, that's what God wants us to do so a practical way we can connect personally is by being a blessing blessing the next thing we need to do is listen carefully listen carefully Jesus after he resurrected he started to visit different disciples and he visited a couple of disciples and they're having a conversation And they didn't recognize that it was Jesus. And so he kind of jumps into this conversation. In Luke 24, we see what happens. So Jesus is noticing that these two disciples, they're a little lonely. They're a little depressed. They're exactly where they should be because their hopes of a savior, the person that they thought that was going to bring back the kingdom and so forth, just died. And so they're kind of mourning right now. And Jesus jumps into this conversation in the middle of this emotional moment. And here's what he says. He asked them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stood still and their faces were sad. So he could see that something was wrong with them by their body language. One of them was named Cleopas, which I love because one of the best things that we can do when we're connecting with people is know their names, remembering their names. Like what's up bro and what's up David has two different connotations. Saying someone's name is so powerful. So Cleopas is one of the names. He said to Jesus, are you the only person visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know? Don't you know about the things that have happened here and there in the last few days? And this is Jesus questioning back to them. What things? Jesus asked. And so you see here in this interaction, what Jesus was doing, he was basically connecting with them. He was asking questions and allowing them space and room to talk. How many of us have been in conversations with people and you thought that, oh, the conversation went really well, but you were the only one talking the whole time? Oh, that's a great conversation. The other person didn't say anything. You were just talking most of the time. And so for us, even as believers, one time, some of the things that we can do and be guilty of is talking way too much. I've heard it said, my mom used to say this, God has given you two ears and one mouth for a reason. So you listen more than you talk. And so Jesus, he listened, and the practical way that helped them to listen is he just asked questions. He was great at asking questions. And so our goal when connecting with people is to get them to talk. Hey, tell me your story. Hey, tell me where you're from. As people start to open up and unpack, you get to know them more on a, on a deeper level. I found this pretty interesting that the word listen and the word silent have the same letters. Why is that? Maybe because in order for us to listen well, we need to be silent and give people the opportunity to talk. Uh, We all do this. You ever go up to people and say, hey, how are you doing? And you're not really wanting them to answer that question. You just want to be nice. Hey, how are you doing? And what are you expecting? Oh, good, good. How are you doing? Oh, good, good. And then you just kind of go about your business. And so on a few occasions, I've done this. I've asked the person, hey, how are you really doing? So after the good, good, and then you say good, I ask them, no, no. How are you really, really doing? Like, tell me how you're doing. 
And just that follow-up question to the initial how you're doing is a game changer. I remember uh, asking this person, and it was unplanned. And when you ask these questions, you just got to be ready because you don't know what a person is going to say. And so I asked the person, how are you really doing? And this person started to unpack their life to me. And it was so honest and so real, and I was just like, I did not sign up for this. Like, I was just thinking, oh, I go about my business, and it ended up being an hour conversation about what was happening in their life. And I found myself kind of like reaching for my stuff. I got stuff to do. I got things to do. You know, like, you ever been there? Like, you're just busy. Like, oh, this wasn't planned, but it's those unplanned moments sometimes that God wants to interrupt our lives that have the most fruit in the hearts of people. And having that hour-long conversation opened the door to a ongoing relationship that's still happening to this day. And I think for us that people really want to know that, like, we care about them. And if we give them an opportunity to talk and really get to know them in their lives, what God will do when we really value people, like, not just say, like, yeah, we love people, hey, hi, bye, but really make time for them in our lives. When we do that, see what God wants to do in and through us. The fourth thing is this, serve selflessly. Serve selflessly. Hebrews 13, 16 says this, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. And so we need to look for practical ways to serve them, helping people move, uh, taking them to the airport. These are practical ways in which we can serve people. Uh, offering to babysit if you have that skill um, and so forth. There's practical ways. And so the more you get to know people, the more that you'll understand their needs and the more that you can meet the, those needs with the love of Christ. I saw this video that really encouraged me on how we can practically be a neighbor. And I hope this video encourages you as well. So take a look on screen. far away on mission. I really did. I really thought my calling would be international and I never, never in a million years thought that the Lord would ask me to walk outside of my door and get to know my neighbors. I'm Kristen Shell, and I live in Austin, Texas. I am a wife and a mother of four children. Any given day, or in the minivan. I am active in the kids' school. I'm a writer, and I volunteer at church. We've been in this neighborhood um, almost 10 years. I always knew we were supposed to love our neighbors because that's the great commandment. But how you live that out day to day is hard, um, especially when you don't know your neighbors, which is the situation I was in. I did not know my neighbors. Sure, I knew, you know, a handful of them. And so there was this huge question, what do you want me to do, Lord? Here I am, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to walk across the street and bang on doors? Do you want me to take cookies? What do you want me to do, Lord? God answers prayers in really winsome ways. I was hosting a party with a friend in our backyard and I didn't have any tables. And so I ordered a picnic table from Lowe's. And when it arrived two days later, I knew, I knew that for the purposes of the party, I was gonna have it in my backyard. But as soon as that party was over, I was moving that table in the front yard and it was gonna be a gathering place. And so I painted it turquoise, which is my favorite color. And I did, I put it outside underneath the tree in the front yard. It was awkward at first. So I have this table, it's bright turquoise, it's sitting in the front yard, and now I'm like, well, now what do I do? So I took a whole bunch of stuff out with me. I took my phone and my journal and my computer, and I even, um, I had some art stuff that I was working on, because, you know, I needed to look like I was just doing something. By going out front, I was saying to God, here I am, Lord, your will be done. Go before, behind, and beside me into the neighborhood. And that very day, life changed. And I met a neighbor within three hours of putting a table out in my front yard. A lot has happened since putting the table out there. There are a handful of women who are now very close friends who I did not know. 
It has become kind of a gathering place. Hi, I'm Bob. This is my daughter, Peggy. <laughs> So one of the best things is just the sense of normal community, everyday life. The neighborhood kids come over, they'll do homework when the weather's pretty. We've had lemonade stands, hot cocoa stands. More intimately, um, it's a place where I can meet and have met neighbors um, who now pop by with coffee and just for 15 minutes, a, co a conversation over coffee that wouldn't have happened. The Lord has taught me and I am learning to be present. Um, that it sounds like it should be a no-brainer, but listening is not um, a skill that came naturally at first to me, nor was being present. This was really, really fun. It was great to see you here. Loving my neighbors has taught me how to love God better. It's drawn me into deeper relationship with Him. You don't need permission or a program to go outside and be who Christ has called you to be. When we'd open up our front door, we take three steps right out our front yard, good things happen. You open up your door and let God do the rest. I hope that inspired you really put ideas on your mind on how we can practically do this. I love that she was just busy. She had a lot of things, but God gave her that one idea. Just put a, a table out in front of your house and see what God will do. And anything done with faith is just a seed of really God wanting to breathe on it to impact people. And so I hope that you were, when you were watching that, that God was maybe putting some thoughts in your head on how you can practically live this out in your life. And as God starts to speak to us and we do these things to intentionally love people, here's some two reminders that I want to leave us with tonight. The first reminder is this. We got to remind ourselves that God has placed us where we are for a purpose. There's this verse in Acts 17, 26, and it says this. For one man, he, God, made all the people of the world. Now they live all over the earth, but here's what God did. He decided exactly when they should live. And he decided exactly where they should live. So the fact that you and I are alive today means this, that God has put us here on this earth for such a time as this. And the specific place where we live, we have been divinely placed there by God. It's not a random coincidence that you're there, but it's by divine purpose that God has placed us where we live, where we work, for divine reason and this reason is to love people in that area that he wants us to bring the light within our heart and shine it in the dark places that he calls us to live and so the moment that we're in right now is really a crucial moment that we have to see our lives and see our homes and see our jobs through the lens of purpose i'm here for a purpose god i'm not just here to get my rest. I'm not just here to collect a paycheck. God, you put me here for divine purpose, and that's to make a difference in the lives of people. The second thing is this. We got to remind ourselves is this, that people around us matter to God. They matter to God. A famous verse, we all know this, John 3, 16 says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life people matter so much to god that he was willing to send his son to die for their sins so that they can be reconnected back to him so people really matter to god and when i was reading this verse god really spoke to me about this idea of the world so when we think for god so loved the world we think just generally the whole world but god really spoke to me this we can kind of change this verse to be for God so loved my world the people within my sphere of influence my family my neighbors my co-workers the people that I see at the gym God so loved my world that he placed me in it that the love that he has in me wants to flow through me to impact their lives the world is tired of hearing, come to church. Come with me to church. The world is tired of that. You know what the world is desperate for? The believers actually being the church. Bringing Jesus 
to our relationships in our lives. One of the things that COVID did is that it kind of got people stuck into an isolation mindset where we just are shrinking our worlds, where we were just living out of our homes for a year. And what God wants us to do as believers is to, to begin to enter into people's worlds with the love of Jesus. Bringing him into our workplaces and so forth. And so as I was praying about this message, God reminded me and gave me this picture. God speaks to me through sensing and through pictures. And this picture came to my mind of this video game at Fun Factory. I don't know if you ever remember it. It's called The Coin Dozer. And how many of us have seen this before? How many of us played this game before? You ever seen people there? They're just there with a jar and they start putting coins in there. Like they don't move, right? They're just there the whole time. <clears throat> and if you ever go there like to like a DMVs or something, you're just kind of looking for the, the one with the most coins ready to fall, right? <laughs> and then you're just like, oh, that's the one that we got we to gotta put in. And, and I was just thinking about a practical message like this, and it kind of relates to this idea of a coin dozer, um, where... When we are interacting with people, sometimes we want them to just like know Jesus immediately. Like we want one conversation to be like a super spiritual conversation where you lead them to Jesus in that moment. And you're like, great. And so we want, we're, we're so stuck on the big, dramatic, huge moments when it really is just little seeds of faith consistently over time that softens the heart of a person. And so a person's heart is kind of like this coin dozer machine. You don't know how many coins are in their heart. You don't know how many seeds have been deposited there. All you know is the amount of seeds you have. And what God is calling us to do as believers is to not worry about the outcome of what happens in their heart. We can't control that. We can't control a person coming to know Jesus or not. The only thing that we can control is the amount of coins that we invest into their lives. So each coin is symbolic of one act of kindness, one conversation that happened, an interaction that you had when you went out of your way to do something for the benefit of the other person. Every single one of these intentional moments that we have in our lives is like one coin deposited into their hearts. And the more coins you put in, the more potential that you have for the outcome of them coming to know Jesus. But too often we're focused on, man, I put $2 in that person already, man, there's nothing's happening. <laughs> I don't have enough coins. And this is why we have to remind ourselves that before we can love people, we need to receive God's love. Because some of us, our coin jars are empty. And it's impossible for you to in, in, in deposit into the hearts of people and impart to them if God hasn't filled up your cup. But if your cup is filled... And you've been connecting with God. And that's why prayer and connecting with God on a daily basis is so important. Because we posture ourselves before God. God deposits coins into our lives. And then we take those coins and we deposit into the hearts of people. So if your jar is empty, God is calling you to reconnect back to him. To fill up so that you can pour out. But some of us here, we filled up. Got a lot of coins. God wants us to now take these coins and start consistently investing everywhere we go. And if we can every single day take the amount of coins that God has given us and then we come home empty, it positions us, I got to get filled back up again. So come to God, God, fill me up, Lord, so that I can go back out to love people. And so this posture of depending on God and then you being used by God to go and love the world is the rhythm in which God wants us to live. And if we can do this consistently, let me tell you, we will make an impact. The call on this church is to plant churches all over the world. We've had so many prophetic words about planting churches here and there. One of the prophetic words over this church is that we're going to have, especially this campus, 30 different services happening at random times. And as a staff, we've been trying to think about how does this actually work? You know how it works? When we start loving our communities. When we start doing what we're doing here, what we just talked about here, and we do it in our own communities, we can start stuff in the places where God has placed us. We don't have to go all over the world. We can love right where we're at and see what God does when we take a, a step of obedience to be used by Him and see the hearts that He wants to change in and through our lives.
This message challenged me, and I want to encourage all of you. Let's be doers of the word and love the people that God has placed in our lives. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. God, we pray right now, Lord, that you would begin to infuse in us, Lord, ways and means that you're calling us to practically love. Lord, take a general message about loving people and make it specific to each person's heart. God, you know the context that they're in. You know the situations that they face. And Lord, I pray, Lord, even now that you would just give us divine ideas. Give us names and faces of people that you're calling us to love. The neighbors in which you placed around in our lives, God, that we will see them through a different lens. And I pray that we will be a church that lives out what your word is calling us to, God. Forgive us, Lord, where we've been selfish, where we've gotten caught up with ourselves, our work, and our responsibility, that we missed out on opportunities that you're calling us to on a daily basis. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you would deposit something in our hearts so that we can be the church that you're calling us to be. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen.